Welcome to the Opportunity Zones podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Atkinson. Is the ongoing transformation of Detroit creating an investment opportunity for Opportunity Zone investors? Here to discuss Detroit and OZs with me today is Jed Halbert, partner at Great Water Opportunity Capital. And he joins me today from Detroit, Michigan. Jed, great to meet you. Great to have you on the show. Welcome. How are you doing? Great. I'm doing very well, Jimmy. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here with us today, Jed. So we're going to be talking a lot about Detroit, Michigan today, but first, maybe we can talk about the transformation that the city has been through and continues to go through over the course of the last decade, really following in the footsteps of other cities that came back from lows in the 80s and 90s. Detroit's been left behind a little bit, but it, it seems yes. to be resurging now. So can you characterize that transformation or that resurgence for our listeners? Absolutely. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about other cities coming back from the 80s and 90s that, you know, if you had gone to Philadelphia or DC or large parts of New York a couple of decades ago, you never could have imagined what they look like now. And that exact same process that has happened everywhere else, Detroit is just the last major city for that to occur in. And so for people who haven't been to Detroit in five or 10 years, who only know the terms bankruptcy when they think about Detroit or think about the old auto industry, I, I really believe if they came to visit today, they would be shocked by the quality of life in Detroit, by the level of energy you feel in Detroit. Walking around downtown, there's people on the streets, there's bars and restaurants open. It feels great. It's not just downtown. There's beautiful historic neighborhoods around downtown with great old architecture that are getting renovated and filled in uh, by young professionals and young families. So the, the transformation had been occurring several years prior to the bankruptcy. And then because of what the bankruptcy did, and we can talk about this in more detail, it really took off since then. And so if you haven't been to Detroit in a while and you've seen what has happened to every other city, we really characterize this as sort of the last chance to get in early in the transformation in a major American metro area. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that bankruptcy, how that unfolded, and what have been some of the results coming from sure. the bankruptcy. Sure. So I, you know, starting just personally, I had the pleasure, I'm from Detroit originally, and I moved back in 2014 after a career on the East Coast to work for the mayor in the bankruptcy. And my, you know, through a diff several different roles, I was ultimately what's called the group executive for planning, housing, and development, really responsible for Detroit's economic development and population growth strategy. So the bankruptcy afforded us an opportunity to make sure the city departments were capable of doing what they need to be able to do. So I was responsible for the planning and the housing departments. They had deteriorated significantly. They had a number of skilled staff. They had staff that really should have been doing another job. They didn't have sufficient resources and they weren't being led in the right way. The tools that the bankruptcy gave us allowed us to reshape those departments to make sure that they could do what a functional city needs to do. And my experience in the planning and housing department was replicated by my colleagues overseeing the police department, emergency services, road maintenance, parks, et cetera. So every city department got a refresh and then the financial restructuring gave the city the financial room to breathe in order to make investments. And you know, the way I think about it is the changes you've seen in places like Philly or Cleveland or Cincinnati and Milwaukee in the last 20 years, those didn't happen because those cities turned into Singapore, right? They are not. American cities are complicated. There is no such city where permitting is incredibly easy, where the politics aren't complicated. When you're in a big city, that's just part of the game. The, the issue is a big city needs to be good enough. And what we see in a lot of the other big cities, including New York, is they are good enough that the economy can respond to demand for companies and people to live, work, and play in the city. And the bankruptcy allowed Detroit to be good enough, just in the way that other cities are good enough, that really allowed that inflow of interest to finally express itself in the city, you know, five, 10, or 20 years after you began seeing that same trend in most other major American cities. Yeah, that's really interesting. So not, not even really that high of a bar to clear. <laughs> you just want to go from bad to good enough, right? It, that's exactly right. And I said that with all due respect to people who work at cities, I've spent yeah. a good chunk of my career working in mayor's offices, both for the mayor of Detroit and also for four years for the mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg. There's a lot of talented people, but cities are complicated. 
you would never have a private conglomerate that does as many things as a city does, hmm. plus all the politics on top of it. But you figure out how to run it in a way that gets, gets what needs to get done, done. And there's such a revealed preference for people to live in walkable, diverse urban neighborhoods. And the pricing change that you've seen in those neighborhoods and cities across the country shows economically when those prices are skyrocketing, it's because there is a national shortage of walkable, diverse urban neighborhoods. And Detroit is like the strategic reserve for the nation of walkable urban neighborhoods because of all these great areas that were built really before the automobile took over that still have the walkable dense infrastructure and that are now being filled back in. Yeah, a lot of those uh, areas in downtown Detroit, correct me if I'm wrong, I would, I'm just kind of speculating now, I would yeah. imagine they were, they were created at the uh, turn of the previous century, the early 1900s, uh, as the automobile industry was just first starting to take off, is, and, but they've kind of been left, uh, left behind for, for quite That's a exactly while. That's exactly right. And, yeah, okay. That's you, exactly you, right. And I've seen a wave of reinvestment. I mean, Detroit was fortunate that Detroit was full of a lot of the richest people on earth in 1900, 1910, 1920 when the taste in architecture was really good. Mm -hmm. And so cities that got rich at different eras dem demolished a whole bunch of stuff and put up stuff that I think most people regard as ugly. But the architecture that was built in Detroit, whether it's the skyscrapers, the apartment buildings, the single family homes is really world-class. And a lot of it was lost in the decline, but a lot of it was preserved. And there is life being breathed into those buildings. That, that is what Great Water does. And we are far from alone in that, whether it's single family homeowners moving into old neighborhoods or Dan Gilbert buying skyscrapers downtown. It's taking advantage of that historic set of really incredible world-class buildings uh, that can be great again and, and that are being invested in again. Now, I want to talk more about what Great Water is doing in Detroit and, and what you're doing specifically uh, within the Opportunity Zone structure, uh, but, but, but still wanted to kind of play out this this Detroit transformation story a, a right. little bit more for a couple more minutes. So you just mentioned Dan Gilbert and Jed, you and I, before we hit the record button, we're talking about Dan Gilbert um, of Rocket Mortgage, you know, coming into the city of Detroit. W what has he done? Can you characterize his involvement sure. downtown and, and how much that has had an impact in the city? Dan has been an incredible force for change in the city. And as a very successful entrepreneur and businessman, he is, of course, ahead of the game. So even even prior to the bankruptcy, Dan Gilbert uh, looked at what was happening in every other major American city, as we've discussed, and saw the changes that had happened and asked why it wouldn't happen in Detroit. Was there anything structurally different about the Detroit metropolitan area that would somehow prevent this change from occurring? And his answer was no. This is a big city with more than 5 million people in the surrounding area. A lot of, a lot of smaller cities have seen major revivals. It will happen in Detroit. And you started to see these green shoots of the early coffee shops and restaurants popping up even before the bankruptcy. And he has made it public, even from his own hiring when he was running Quicken Loans, he was having a hard time convincing people to come work at his suburban campus because the quintessential 25-year-old out of college wanted to go work in a fun city neighborhood. So before the bankruptcy, he observed what he's termed a skyscraper sale. And he went to downtown Detroit and he bunch of whole, bought a whole bunch of these old beautiful buildings and he moved a lot of team members down and he grew the company like crazy. So from moving 5,000 people down perhaps to having a firm of 40,000 people downtown, uh, it made a huge difference. He was definitely not alone. He was alongside a lot of great public foundations or private foundations, I should say, like Kresge and Ralph Wilson and Ford and other major corporate actors like Blue Cross and Blue Shield, General Motors headquartered downtown, et cetera. But the sort of extra energy he brought, the quantity of team members, and then the amount of real estate investment that he's personally done through his own real estate firm downtown has really sort of shocked the system in a good way and brought a lot of energy on top of all the other trends that were already occurring. And I'm sure he was able to do that at a fraction of the yes. cost, a fraction of a fraction of the cost that uh, that it would have been had he tried to do so in Chicago or, or New York or, or any one of yes. those other large downtown cities that are absolutely that are a little a bit more popular the replacement the cost. I'm sorry, sorry. I say that again I was going to say also a fraction of the replacement cost too I mean yes. relative to new buildings he's in a lot of beautiful old buildings at a great great price point yep uh, and I know that's a large part of, of your strategy 
as well. Uh, shifting gears to opportunity zones now, actually, I want to just kind of pull up uh, on, on my computer screen over here. I wanted to find out on, uh, on opportunitydb.com what kind of amount of uh, opportunity zones there are in Detroit. Uh, and we'll have a link to this in the show notes page for today, but it looks like the city of Detroit has 70 designated yes. opportunity zones. A lot of them clustered right in that central downtown area, um, right across the river from, from Windsor, Ontario, um, kind of in the heart of downtown Detroit. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity there, clearly. What, um, uh, so I want to I touch on that in a minute, but, but maybe, maybe, maybe first, Jed, what lured you back to Detroit after sure. spending some time on the East Coast? You mentioned you were working in Mayor Bloomberg's office in New York City. I think you spent a little extra time on, on, on the East Coast as well. What, what caused you to come back? What was the attraction? So I, you know, I, I left, I graduated from high school in the 90s. And like the average person in Detroit at that point, I left Detroit and didn't expect to return because at that time, the city was not a vibrant place to live and the economic situation was not great. And so a lot of us moved elsewhere to the East Coast, to the West Coast, a lot to Chicago and really built a career. So I, I built a career in real estate in the public and private sector, like you said, in Mayor Bloomberg's office and then in the Goldman Sachs Urban Investment Group as a principal investor in Goldman at Tishman Construction as the head of strategy and also helping them start up a principal investing firm. And every morning living up and down the East Coast, whether it was Philly or Boston or D.C. or New York, I would start the morning by reading the Detroit Free Press and the Detroit News. I was obsessed with Detroit. And I, I lived in these neighborhoods in these cities in the late 90s and from 2000 to 2014, where you could see the transformation happening in Williamsburg or in Center City, Philadelphia, or in the 14th Street corridor of DC. And I would see what was happening in the cities where I lived, and I would read the paper and think, why would this not happen to Detroit? It's just like what we talked about with Dan Gilbert. There's nothing different. There's, 5 million people in the metro area. There's tens of thousands of college grads every year from all the schools. This will happen and when. And so I began to see these green shoots of the new restaurants and bars, the sort of classic early signs of people moving in. And then when the city declared bankruptcy, I thought this is the moment. This is the inflection point where if the city can clean up its balance sheet and create financial breathing room and the city can refresh its operations to be good enough, like we talked about, that will take this incipient change and supercharge it. And Detroit will be on the same path as other cities are for several decades of investment of rebuilding the urban core. So I thought, I love this city. I see incredible opportunity. I need to be a part of that. So I reached out through contacts, made contact with the mayor, and then came home in 2014 in the middle of the bankruptcy uh, to help him restructure the city which pretty quickly, if anyone is feeling bored in their career, a municipal bankruptcy is a great way to address that. It is a masochistic undertaking, given how much needs to get done. But it, it worked. It was a great experience. Uh, and so when I, after four years in the mayor's office, decided to leave, that's when I found a great water with my partners, because we saw that there was so much real estate opportunity that still wasn't being tapped, that we needed to create one of the entities that was going to figure out how to make it happen. So let's talk about that opportunity. As I mentioned, there's, you know, according to my, my map here at Opportunity DB, there's 70 opportunity zones in the city of Detroit, large amount of them concentrated right in that downtown area, right across uh, the river from Canada. What are some of the, so uh, clearly there's an opportunity there. I think yes. it, it, it's been economically uh, distressed for, for a long time, which is what led to, you know, uh, there being so many eligible areas in downtown Detroit, unlike, you know, a lot of other cities around the country. If you look, if you look at Chicago, there really aren't a lot of opportunities. Zone. I don't think there's any opportunity zones in the loop in Chicago. They're all on the South side, on the West side in New York city, for instance, they're all, um, you know, you, you got to go pretty far North. They're, they're mostly right. in the Bronx and above there's, 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 I think there's a couple on the, on the, on the East side of, of lower Manhattan, but the ma vast majority of them are, you know, up, um, past Central Park, north of Central Park. And then in Los Angeles, there's a handful and particularly in East LA, but, but Detroit, um, looking at Detroit, I mean, it's, it's, there's all clusters. 
right in the heart of downtown there. What are some of the demand drivers now in Detroit that are kind of leading to some of this, uh, this, this economic revitalization that's occurring in, in, in downtown in these Absolutely. options? Absolutely. So before the demand drivers, to your point on the, on the OZ um, mm-hmm. districts and how they got placed, you know, my team, part of my role as the group executive for planning, housing, development, and city was thinking about how to use all of our tools, including opportunity zones. So we really partnered with the state to think strategically, where will these zones be placed in Detroit? Where can they be placed in Detroit to maximize impact? And to your point, unlike a lot of other American cities, because of the downturn, almost every census tract in Detroit met the income requirements for OZ designation. And so we were able to say, we have our pick of where they go. The question is, is where will investors want to be where the OZ, the addition of the OZ is enough to flip the switch to make it a real investable proposition. And that is all of downtown, essentially all of greater downtown, plus a number of strategic neighborhoods outside downtown that lined up with the city's own investment priorities. So the city had a fund called the Strategic Neighborhood Fund to do capital improvements, to support retail, to invest in parks and streetscapes and do the other public sector actions that can really fire up the energy in the neighborhood. So we layered the city's strategic neighborhood fund investments and the opportunity zone districts to create environments where investors could really make a difference. And what we're seeing in those neighborhoods is that it's working. The demand drivers for a classic, it's a, it's a cliched term, but it's cliched for a good reason. The live work play approach in Detroit is just what you've seen in other cities. That The young kids come down out of college because they want to live in a fun neighborhood with bars and restaurants. The employers follow them because they want to be able to attract the kids who work there. And then the hospitality industry gets built around them because that's where they socialize. And you start this virtuous cycle. And the virtuous cycle has been running enough in Detroit that you can see the generations of it, so to speak. So the the 25-year-old couple that met in downtown or midtown Detroit living in a little apartment Five years later, they're married, they're having a kid, they're buying a house in one of the historic neighborhoods and renovating that. And the whole chain of revitalization coming out of that really, you know, in its core live, work, play dynamic that has started in the heart of downtown is what we think is going to propel us for a long time. That makes perfect sense. Uh, And some good insight there. It's interesting to point out that differentiator for Detroit is the fact that so many of their opportunity zones are clustered right in the heart of downtown, unlike a lot of other American cities where their opportunity zones may be a little bit more scattered or, or not quite as concentrated. Right. Um, another huge differenti- differentiator for Detroit and for your group at, at Great Water in particular, Jed, is how you guys are doing your opportunity zone deals. Uh, you are not, for the most part, you're not doing ground up construction of multifamily, but because of some characteristics of Detroit, you guys are primarily doing substantial improvement of multifamily, which can be very difficult in most other places in the country. Uh, and you spoke about this already a little bit, but I was hoping you can sure. drill down a little bit deeper here. What is unique about Detroit in this regard? What is it that allows you to be able to do substantial improvement of multifamily properties where it would be darn near impossible in in some other places in the country. And actually, bef- kind of before I let you answer that question, if you sure. find, indulge me for a moment here, for any listeners and viewers who are a little bit new to Opportunity Zones, uh, just a quick explainer here. In, in order to qualify or be compliant with Opportunity Zone investing uh, regulations, you cannot simply just buy and hold an already stabilized asset. You either have to put a new building into service for the first time, which constitutes original use, or you have to substantially improve a property. And that's defined as doubling the basis in the property, excluding the land value, um, doubling the basis in, in the value of the building, essentially. Uh, so in most places, it's very difficult to meet substantial improvement, but in Detroit, uh, so that's why so many Opportunity Zone projects you see around the country are typically going to be ground up construction, and there's a lot of uh, risks that are associated with new ground up, uh, but Detroit offers this opportunity to do substantial improvement. So 
I'll get off my soapbox and Jed, I'll let you get on yours. What, what's unique about Detroit in this regard in particular? So exactly, given, you know, given the nature of the substantial improvement test, and again, leaving aside the sort of detail about the land reduction and other details of the regulation, just to speak in round terms, if you buy a unit for 100,000, you need to invest another 100,000. If you buy a unit for 150, you need to invest another 150. You see how pretty quickly, if you're buying units for six figures, you're getting post-improvement a total unit cost that is a quarter million, 300,000 or more. The difference in Detroit is you still have an amazing stock of old buildings. Again, you know, some of the best buildings on the planet that were built 100 years ago, but they have not, in many cases, been cared for for a long time. Many of them are vacant or all, almost vacant. And so we have bought at this point, I think we've purchased 37 buildings at this point for uh, per unit acquisition costs that could be $40,000, $50,000, $60,000. We invest another forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, depending on the asset. And you have an all-in acquisition cost per unit of 100 grand, 125 grand. It obviously depends on the deal, but it, it works for substantial improvement because you clearly meet the test. And then you've got a great economical, what we would describe as workforce housing style unit. You know, we are not in our renovated buildings producing luxury housing. These are old buildings. They don't have central air. We're not putting in central air. They don't have a washer dryer in every unit and we're not putting one in, but they are well-located. They have incredible bones. They have beautiful architecture. And for the classic 25-year-old moving downtown, it's an easy sell. A lot of our one beds rent for 1,200 bucks. That's an incredible deal to be living downtown. You're walking distance to all the bars and restaurants. You're walking distance to four major sports teams. You're walking distance to your job for those still going to the office or to other attractions like the museum and the library. And you know, at that price point, it's very, very compelling. And so it's a great income strategy for us in terms of the target demographic. We're able to meet the substantial improvement test and supply housing for a young workforce level renter, which are incredibly plentiful in the city. It's why all of our buildings are full and demand is very, very strong. Yeah, that's a competitive pricing for sure, especially if it's if you're comparing it to a few other urban areas that have a lot of those same amenities, the, the four sports teams within walking distance and the restaurants and the bars. I mean, I'm thinking of Chicago or I'm thinking of New York City, maybe right. being two, uh, two prime competitors. Um, and yeah, you're paying a heck of a lot more than, than that per month as a, right. as a tenant. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier, Jed, you and me, before we hit the record button about a resident survey that uh, you guys did, which, which gave you some really good information on, on, on your tenants. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that resident survey and what you, sure. what you learned from that and what-, uh, yeah, what so we, Absolutely. So the, the principals of Greywater at this point have bought almost 1,500 units. They're in various stages of development, but maybe 700 of them are occupied. And so we recently went out to survey the tenants to try to understand more about the customer base we're serving. And it confirmed a lot of the sort of quintessential elements of the early phase of urban revitalization, that they are on average 27 years old, they make on average $50,000 a year. These are young up and coming professionals moving into these neighborhoods and starting their lives in the city. Uh, I think it's a great reflection on the diversity of the demand for Detroit that the vast majority of these people do not work in automotive. 13% of the tenants we survey work in automotive. There is a very good mixture of people who work in media, tech, healthcare, education, hospitality, food and beverage. It's a very diverse economic base that we see in our tenants and, and a very diverse origin. You know, less than 30% of them moved from somewhere else in the city of Detroit. More than 70% come from outside the city. And that also is pretty mixed. A lot of them from the suburbs, a lot from Michigan outside of the Detroit metro area, and a lot from other states outside of Michigan. So to us, it really showed the the diversity of the demand and the economic support for the tenant base that we were talking about. It's, it's typical of the tenants you see in you know, similar phases of development in Chicago or other cities. It's the young folks with a whole bunch of different jobs who are united by their desire to live in an urban neighborhood. And it's not even necessarily driven by where they work, that two thirds of our tenants commute out to the suburbs, but want to live in the city because that's, that's where they, that's the narrative they tell about themselves. They're city people. They want to be around the other city people in these walkable neighborhoods. Um, and they can do so at a price that would be, you know, almost perceived as a 
internet trap in other cities because it's so affordable still in many of these apartments. Sure, sure. So we've we've covered a lot of ground already on this episode today, Jed. We've we've talked about Detroit, its transformation. We've talked about the the housing stock that you're able to get. Uh, we've talked about your tenants. What about your investors? I'm curious to know who is it that's investing with you? Who is your capital base essentially? And also where are their gains coming from? How much owes the equity have you raised to date? Sure. Talk, talk, talk a little bit about the investor side of things. If you don't sure. Know. So we in total, we've raised over $150 million of equity. More than two thirds of that is OZ equity. So about, it's about 105 million OZ equity that's been raised to date. We've done this in a series of OZ funds over the last three and a half years that Great Water has been in existence. And then the principals also did some funds prior to Great Water's formation. Um, those funds are both single asset and multi-asset, depends on the fund. And when we started off years ago, it was a classic sort of working the network of wealthy professionals verging into real high net worth individuals who were interested in investing in Detroit. We're very proud to say there's many investors who are in fund number one who are now with us in fund number nine because they really value the relationship we've built with them and the returns that we've delivered for them from the early assets. Um, we've also diversified the investor base. So it's not just professionals and high net worth individuals, we're up in family offices and also some real you know, institutional corporate partners placing institutional money in Detroit. That is partially a reflection of Detroit's increased investability and partially a reflection of the track record and the systems we've built at Great Water to become an institutional investor quality partner to the firms that are interested in exposure to Detroit and don't, don't have a lot of ways to get that exposure. Uh, to your point about the gains, also diverse, I'd say that the two biggest pools are uh, tech-related gains, whether it's from selling companies or, or stock investing, and also other real estate investors who had assets they disposed of in other cities uh, and are seeing what's going on in Detroit. And we've, we've had this conversation with investors, particularly real estate guys who were early to invest in downtown Brooklyn or other neighborhoods that were up and coming, and they see the same cycle happening in Detroit. They're not going to be the ones to get on the ground. They've hit a point in their career where they're not fired up to like roll up their sleeves and go diligence a bunch of assets in Detroit. We will do that for them. But they can still benefit from the trajectory that they're seeing um, in this investment proposition by partnering with us to get exposure to this market. And like me and like a lot of our listeners and viewers and a lot of the other project sponsors that I've interacted with in this Opportunity Zone space, over the last three or four years, you are heavily invested in multifamily, or at least you have been to date. It's, it's by right. far the most popular real estate segment to be in for opportunities on investors. But I'm just curious, given the current economic climate that we find ourselves in, you know, the stock market and the bond markets are way down, interest rates are on the rise. The, the Fed last week just uh, increased um, the interest rate by 75 bips. Looks like we're heading into a recession. We're in this inflationary environment where we've seen inflation at you know above eight um, percent right. year over year for the past couple of months. You know, highest levels we've seen in in four decades. Um, given that, what are some real estate segments that you like going forward? Do you still like multifamily? Are you looking at at other segments? What are your thoughts there, Jed? We still like multifamily a lot, and we're beginning to look at other segments too, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But first on the multifamily, we still see great demand. I mean, our properties are leasing up quickly, occupancy is strong, rent growth is strong. And when we think about the fundamental drivers, there's always cyclicality in whatever industry you have to deal with, recessions, et cetera. We see the, the structural, the secular change in Detroit over the long run is really trumping that up and down cyclicality, meaning, if you look at the Detroit metropolitan area of more than 5 million people, and you look at the fact that 50,000 college graduates come out of Detroit area colleges every year from Wayne State, University of Detroit, University of Michigan, Eastern Michigan, Michigan State, Oakland, et cetera, there's this fire hose of young graduates in a huge metro area. And today, despite you know, a lot of growth since the bankruptcy, a minuscule fraction of them live in the city compared to what you would see in other cities. There is a enormous amount of demand yet to be satisfied to bring Detroit to the level of a, even a Cincinnati or a Milwaukee in terms of its share of young college educated professionals. So we think that is an incredible structural driver of growth for multifamily because 
as in other cities, this flip switch and all of a sudden every 25 year old recognized, I wanna live in the fun place where all the other ones live and that is in the city. Now, in addition to multifamily, we're beginning to experiment with certain types of retail because we think it's an important part about neighborhood development. We wanna play a role in bringing the retail amenities that a lot of our tenants want. We're leasing up a retail project now, I should say a mixed use project with you know, apartments upstairs and retail on the ground floor. And we have a product which we have really suited for up and coming retail entrepreneurs. It's small footprints, 500 square feet or 1,000 square feet, all rented on a gross rent basis with relatively short lease terms. So for young entrepreneurs uh, without a lot of resources who don't want to get into the complexity of a triple net deal and all that accounting, they don't want percentage rent, they don't want TI, they just want a move-in ready space that's affordable, we've seen great demand for that product. And so that type of retail playing a role uh, we think is very important. Now we're also thinking about ways to address similar types of office product. And you know, since the pandemic, obviously there's a lot of questions everywhere around the future of urban office. And we've seen some signs in Detroit uh, similar to what you see in other places where there are companies saying, we may not need as much office space, but we still wanna be in a great neighborhood. We want people to come to the office sometimes. So we want some space in a great place and maybe a smaller footprint, but we want it to be in a cool neighborhood in a really nice environment. There's been some of those deals and we're exploring how to get into there as well. We're also actually uh, partners in the building where I'm currently sitting, which is a WeWork in Detroit, Detroit's tech town neighborhood. And just as tenants, frankly, of this WeWork here, we've seen a lot of increased office demand as people have been filling up the space uh, as the pandemic has abated somewhat. So we're exploring targeted plays in retail and commercial that really fit what's happening in the city now, while also continuing to place heavy investments in the multifamily that we see as a, as a long way to run, despite the whatever cyclicality may come. Yeah, a lot to keep an eye on uh, going forward in the future. I, I, I tend to agree with you that office does seem to be coming back. I know that was a, a, a tough spot for that sector for a couple of years there. Uh, well, clearly you've painted a very compelling picture of Detroit and the opportunity that exists there throughout the course of our conversation today. Jed, what have been some of the challenges in terms of, specifically in terms of in, con, uh, convincing investors to make the leap of faith and, and invest more in Detroit? What, what, what pushback has been most common with, with regards to raising capital for your projects in Detroit? It's really interesting speaking to our investors. We have not had much of a challenge finding great investment partners. There's certainly a group of people who when you say to them, how about investing in Detroit? Their reaction is essentially, you have to be kidding me. Like, didn't I read all these stories about the bankruptcy and depopulation? Now there's some portion of those people who, who when they come to visit Detroit, say, okay, I get it. This is very different from what I thought it was going to be. And they, they invest with us. But we find most of our investors and the people right from the start who say, yeah, I've seen, I was in Philly 20 years ago and I remember how rough it was in Center City. I was living near 14th Street in DC 20 years ago and I remember how rough that was. I've seen it change. I've read a couple of promising articles. I mean, Detroit gets incredible free media support in the New York Times who always writes, you know, coolest restaurant scene and all these other great supportive articles. So there's a group of investors who are cognizant of what happened in whatever city where they're based, who get some of these little pricks of interest or what could be happening in Detroit. And when they see what we're doing and the assets we've produced, the returns we've had, uh, generally we build a longstanding relationship with them and we've had them through many funds. Well, that's great. That's always a, a, a great place to be in, a, a good success story that you're painting there, uh, both for the city of Detroit and for your group at Great Water. Jed, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. If we have any listeners or viewers out there who are interested in learning more about Detroit or investing in Detroit or more about your group, where can they go to learn more about you and Great Water Opportunity Capital? Absolutely. Yeah, please come to our website, greatwater.us. Greatwater, just one word, dot US. Uh, we have built relationships with people we met through just cold introductions on the website who've been with us through several uh, rounds of fundraising and multiple assets. So if, you, if you're intrigued by the story of Detroit and want exposure to this market, 
uh, or are interested enough to come make an investor tour, please reach out to us. and We'd love to meet you. Terrific. And uh, for our listeners and viewers out there, as always, of course, I will have show notes available for today's episode at opportunitydb.com slash podcast. And there we'll have links to all of the resources that Jed and I discussed on today's show. And also, please be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast listening platform to always get the latest episodes. Jed, again, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thanks so much. Jimmy, thank you very much.